The annual meeting of the World Economic Forum kicked off on Monday in Davos, Switzerland. On the agenda are geoeconomic challenges, stagnant economic growth and a deepening climate crisis. More than 2,700 leaders from 130 countries are attending this year's meeting, including some 50 heads of state and government. We need that transfer of information and knowledge and innovation across borders to be able to lift living standards for all. So that has to be one core part of the discussions here. So joining us now from Davos, Switzerland, for more updates on the World Economic Forum is Arise business correspondent, Rotu Zodiri. Rotu, good morning and um, welcome to the program this morning. So good to see you. It actually looks morning, like, Heidi. yes. Good to be with you all. Good yes. morning, Rotus. Um, I've been to Davos, and I know what the weather is like at this time of the year. It can be quite treacherous on the road, and the cold, it's unbelievable. So I do sympathize with you. <laughs> but first, let's start. What's the economic backdrop for <laughs> Davos you. this year? What's the economic backdrop for Davos this year? Yeah, the, the, the backdrop is one of an economic malaise. Uh, there is a, uh, a chill in the air, and it's not just the weather. It's an economic chill. Just yesterday, the IMF said that uh, economic fragmentation will wipe off about 7 to 7.5% of uh, global GDP growth. You need to imagine what that means to knock off that amount. Uh, Michael Wilson will take you through China's latest GDP figures for 2023. I think they came in at 3%. This is an economy that was growing at 6.3%, 6.5% annually. And you can imagine that knock off to down to 3%. So the backdrop is one of the big R word, recession. That little clip that you played right before you came to me where it was being said that um, Closing the income inequality gap is one of the missions of Davos that has not been uh, achieved. Right before the, um, the forum began, the, uh, the World Economic Forum put out an economic report saying that there was a, a poly crisis out there. That is a crisis from different fronts. They have not been able to close income inequality. There is the climate issue. There were activists that blocked a jet from flying in uh, to Davos saying that the rich and famous do not care about the environment because they're flying in on private planes. Um, there's also, of course, the geopolitical concerns. The Russia-Ukraine uh, war is now, by next month, that will have been on for a year. Uh, you've seen what that has done as far as pushing um, inflation upwards. The World Bank said about 5 million people in Nigeria fell into poverty because of inflation. So it's, 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 it, it's the fear of a global recession. I believe Kristalina Gorgieva, the managing director of the IMF, who is here as well, said that about one third of the global economy will fall into recession. Now, if that, if that follows through, if that happens, you'll have job losses, you have, you know, higher rates of poverty, reduction in economic output. So it's a very, very, um, it's a gloomy, gloomy backdrop for Davos 2023 this year. Well, hello, Rotus in Chile, Davos. Good to see you. We understand there is a surprise meeting between Janet Yellen and China's vice premier Liu He in Davos. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, we just found out about that. Uh, China's Ministry of uh, Commerce Ministry just confirmed that they would be meeting uh, today or I believe tomorrow. Um, so Janet Yellen is on her way to Africa. Um, and so she just added this stop because Liu He, the vice premier, is on the agenda today in Davos where he'll be giving a special address. So the understanding is that this surprise meeting is to allow the U.S. and China discuss a number of macroeconomic issues. Um, Yellen wants to get an update on China's policy. You know, they reversed their zero COVID policy policy. They've opened up their economy. It pushed up oil prices. Markets liked it. However, uh, well, markets today, Asia markets today are down because of the, uh, the, the GDP numbers. But that aside, they want to talk about macroeconomic issues. They also, of course, as you know, there is a, to make a, another analogy to the weather, a chilly uh, relationship between the United States and China. The U.S. has tried to block China's imports of uh, semiconductor uh, in inputs from the U.S. They've uh, blocked a number of companies they feel are spying in, uh, on American companies or over that has listed Chinese listed companies on American exchanges. China has lodged their reports with the World Trade Organization. Actually, we'll be hopefully speaking with uh, Dr. Ngozio Konjuela about that, where they say that the United States is engaging in economic protectionism by not allowing them to get access to their chips. And they'll also be talking to them about COVID as well. While it is a good thing that, well, on one hand, it's a good thing that China is reopening its economy. It's one of the biggest um, consumers of energy, pushing up oil prices. Chinese tourists spent about 200 and 
90 something billion dollars around the world traveling. Um, that's good on the one hand for markets. On the other hand, you've got rising COVID infections. We had to take a COVID test, uh, myself and our superstar producer, Faith Orr, along with uh, uh, every other person that is attending Davos. We all had to take COVID tests because COVID is still very much a concern because China reopening and reversing its stance on zero COVID has meant that infections have, uh, have risen. So macroeconomic concerns, the relationship between US, China, COVID, that's what Janet Yellen, uh, Treasury Secretary of the United States, will be talking to China's Vice Premier Liu He. Uh, Li Hu, either today or tomorrow. So um, uh, let's move on. What about Africa? What is the continent set to get from Davos? Because uh, this Davos 2023, I don't know the number of African heads of state there. Um, Nigeria's head of state, uh, Nigeria's head of government, uh, Mohamed Buhari, is not there. So what are African leaders? What, what do we stand to gain as a continent? Well, we hope to speak to uh, the Minister of Finance of Nigeria, Zainab Ahmed, later today um, to talk to her about, you know, Nigeria's, uh, you know, what Nigeria hopes to get out of this. Uh, also, we hope to, fingers crossed, talk to uh, the Minister, South Africa's Minister of Finance, Mr. Gorongwana, later on in the week. So he's here with the delegation. Uh, Nigeria's Minister of Finance is here. Look, the, 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 the pervading... Uh, narrative for Africa right now is investment, foreign direct investment, and also debt. Uh, we had, of course, our special a week ago today, a special budget, the Arise TV and KPMG, where we looked at the, went in depth on the 2023 budget. The deficit is really large. There's going to be a lot of borrowing for Nigeria. So Nigeria needs as much, to raise revenues as much as possible. Nigeria needs foreign direct investment. So while that really is for more of the purview of the Minister of Trade and Investment for Nigeria. We'll be asking the Minister of Finance to have about that. South Africa, they need investment badly. In fact, uh, Mr. Gorongwana, the Minister of Finance for South Africa, made it clear that his delegation is here to look for investment. But who is going to invest in South Africa if you've got issues with ESCOM, um, which, by the way, just got a tariff increase, where the average South African will be paying about 18% more for power when they're not even getting power and there have been so many shutdowns and uh, load shedding in South Africa. So Africa's main issue... Get as much foreign direct investment, convince investors to return to Africa, also sort out a number of issues. We have a big election next year, so will anyone want to invest in Nigeria until before an election where we're going to be picking a new leader? They might want to wait a minute to see who is the new leader in Nigeria and what that means for Nigeria's economic policy. So for Africa, it's debt, 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 um, and also getting foreign direct investment uh, into our, our coffers. No surprises there. Well, what else is on the agenda today for Davos 2023 broadly? Yeah, there's a lot. Like I said, uh, Liu He is going to be making an address, which is why uh, Janet Yellen is coming to speak with him. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, European Commission president, she will be making uh, an address as well. Uh, Klaus Schwab, executive director, founder of the World Economic Forum. Uh, him and Mr. Uh, Berstein, the president of, uh, of Switzerland, they will have a special address uh, as well. Um, the prime minister of Finland, the prime minister of Spain, I think Farid Zakaria is hosting a chat with the prime minister of, uh, uh, of Finland. So there's a lot of addresses. And so we're going to be hearing from lots of messages from heads of state about economic direction, how they feel about a possible global recession. About 450 sessions are taking place uh, this week. So food security, uh, income inequality, COVID, the economic backdrop, so much is going to be discussed as far as uh, this, this today, this particular day. Well, thank you very much, Rotus. Uh, Rotus is reporting live from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. We look forward to getting more updates from you as the um, forum uh, event continues. For Global Business Update, Michael Wilson joins us now from Cape Town, South Africa. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Um, yes, so you've been hearing a little bit about China from Rotus. Uh, they've had some very mixed um, economic figures out, and that really the markets are fairly mix, uh, mixed in China um, as well. Growth of 3% now. Most of the world wouldn't complain about that, but that's the slowest in decades, although although it's better than expected, 1.8% expected. Now they, they've got 3%. Retail sales also quite good. Another thing which will be concerning um, the delegates at Davos will be China's population. The first figures out dropping for the first time in decades. In fact, dropping for the first time since the one, um, one child per family um, policy was um, imposed upon them in the early 1960s. Um, 70 
the, bir the birth rate fell at 7-0, 7 0, 70% in 2020. Um, and and, and I, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that what worries the authorities there, of course, is a much older population, thus not being um, not being supplied with a working age to a working age population um, to support them. And just a quickie, um, as far as the property market, the, re the real estate sector in China is concerned, PwC has quit Evergrande. Um, one of the reasons is that they've had a, a problem with the way that Evergrande wants to report its 2021 financial statements to remind you that Evergrande owes $20 billion. The Bank of Japan, um, th they are going to pull some outside sort of levers which are very complicated with their monetary policy, but uh, the feeling is that when the Bank of Japan is re reported to make its decision tomorrow, um, interest rates will stay unchanged at 0.1%, although with a bit of tweaking um, as far as the yield curve is concerned, again, it's terribly complicated, but the fact of the matter is that borrowing will be just tight, slightly Slightly more expensive. Um, as far as the United States is concerned, stock futures. Now, again, um, so it was the Martin Luther Day holiday yesterday. Um, but uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley results are weighted very, very keenly indeed. We'll also get um, uh, we'll also get more figures th this evening. The point of this is that really there have been some benign, as far as inflation is concerned, indicators as far as the economy in the United States is running at the moment. And uh, that, that should also um, help the delegates in Davos as well when they start talking about where they think the world economies are going. Again, you heard a little bit from Rotus about China. Um, as the Saudis are saying from that WEF, that World Economic Forum conference in Davos, that they could act as a bridge between the US and China. The Saudi finance minister has been saying that, you know, it, the United States has got a relationship with Saudi, which goes back to the 1930s, i.e. US buys their oil, US gives them the kind of security that they need, and there could be a further, um, further further moves towards cooperation as far as geopolitical tensions are concerned between um, China and the United States. The IMF um, warning again that uh, fragmentation, as they put it, um, in other words, countries not knowing where to go, wondering about the increase of cost of living, increase energy costs and so on, and the war in Ukraine. It could cost the global economy 7% of GDP. If you want to know what that is, um, again, it's, it's a big, big figure. But if you if it, it's a, it, it equates to the total GDP of Germany and Japan, the 7% 7, 7 uh, loss, um, which is being indicated by the IMF. Um, and also countries in the developing world, which are heavily um, reliant on open trade will probably suffer as well. Um, also from Davos, this is Oxfam reporting that the richest 1% got two thirds of the new wealth created um, last year. That was a mere $42 trillion. Um, and again, the, the disparity between the rich and the, and the not so well off just continues as far as Oxfam are concerned. What they're calling for is bigger taxes on the ultra rich. Um, Western banks are still struggling to leave Russia. A number of them are actually stuck there. Only a handful have managed actually to leave um, Russia. Um, for the majority, that what they're trying to do is to, to exit, selling off their assets. But this is complicated by the fact that President Putin has, ju has just said that um, he, has, he will approve um, the d disposal of assets and what he terms as unfriendly um, banks from unfriendly, as he terms it, countries will find it very, very difficult to leave. So in other words, what they'll have to do is take a massive haircut if they want to get out, um, a decision for them. Global air travel will get back to pre-pandemic um, figures, mainly because of the opening up of China um, by mid-2023. There's a company called Avalon, which which is the second, sorry about that, that's one of the doors slamming in the wind, um, one of the doors, one of the um, the largest jet lessors um, in, in the world. And 
they are um, they're, they're predicting a 70% recovery. They're noticing of every two seats sold uh, now in travel, one of those is from an Asian um, country. Bank of England and Andrew Bailey, again, talking to um, other bankers, not so much in Davos, but, but in, in, in the UK, um, saying that there is still a hangover from that brief uh, flirtation that the economy had with uh, Truss and Quarting. Um, it's only a few months ago and still a lot of work to be done as far as uh, the UK um, re 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 retaining and, and reactivating and re-establishing trust in the way the economies run. And finally, an oil, uh, I've got a range for you, a Brent between 85 and 90 possibly, uh, and WTI slightly lower than that obviously, 80 to 85, just because of improved optimism about the global economy. And most of that, most of that stemming A, because we assume that's what's happening in the United, in, in China is the end of the lockdown, and B, slightly more benign, in, benign inflation figures from the United States. That's the global view this morning. Well, thank you very much, Michael. Just to ask him around China, interesting news around, I, I talked about that with regards to a population drop since, you know, in the first in decades, really. But also side by side that report yesterday talking about the revelations coming out with regards to the number of deaths, COVID deaths in China. I'd like you to just touch on that because, you know, we talked about the fact that uh, Chinese officials had released that only 37 people had died uh, from COVID, but now they say it's in the 60,000s. And um, in terms of since the, um, the reopening of the economy, and so the impact of that. And then following that is Saudi Arabia's finance minister talking about um, coming in or wading in the tensions between China and the US, um, bearing in mind that even with Russia and Ukraine, they've been able to mediate um, through facilitation of prisoner swaps between Kiev and Moscow. Uh, what, are the, what are the chances like in terms of coming in as a mediator between US and China? You put your finger on quite an important issue, which is the reliability of figures coming out of China, which I have continually said I don't necessarily believe. It's so difficult to triangulate what's going on there. In other words, to pick um, pick a couple of actual fixed points and then work out which figure are, which figures are correct and which aren't. Um, the population drop um, is something which clearly worries the Chinese authorities, and, and you know for, for all, all kind of reasons. I mean, when at what stage does a does a, 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 a an economy which is, is showing demographics of more and more people getting old and um, not need to depend upon a younger generation to to provide income and thus tax to 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 keep those people um, li living comfortably. Um, again, this this is this is something which um, we, we assume to be uh, correct. But as far as the COVID deaths are concerned, I have no more idea um, than, than you do. Nor does anybody else really about what the true figures are. I think I think what's happening is that generally speaking, never mind the deaths, however tragic and I'm sure they are to the individual families concerned, the fact is that it does appear as though the markets are taking the view that China is reopening again. So I think that really um, is, is, is the big issue as far as uh, China is concerned. Okay, uh, I was just still on the issue of uh, China. The situation with COVID seems to be playing a major role in what is happening there. What's your thought? How long do you think this is going to play out in terms of how it impacts on their economy? Because it's a major one. It is. Um, it, it, it's a major worry. As I was saying, it's very difficult to get um, to, to get proper figures um, out of China as to how far um, they, they have actually reached. I mean, what clearly hasn't worked, and the authorities will not admit this, is that that 100% that lockdown policy has not worked. The only thing, as far as I can tell, and this is, and this is from um, health experts rather than economic experts um, that I speak to, and what they think has happened is that the population hasn't been given the chance to develop a kind of herd immunity to not so much to COVID, but the, the other kind of COVID-like problems that, that 
developed nations suffer from. I mean, th these things are around all the time. They happen to have peaked in a, in a COVID pandemic. That doesn't mean to say that, that, the, that the viruses have, have disappeared. I, I don't think they have. I think you have to. You have to be realistic about things and, and, and work out um, you know, wh wh who is actually being affected by COVID and, and, what, and, and, and whether or not the figures are actually true or not. Um, and one thing that I didn't answer, and I should have, forgive me, um, we were again, uh, I was asked about the relationship between um, between China, uh, sorry, between Saudi, China and the United States. Um, not forgetting that Biden, of course, visited Saudi and asked them if they would kindly, kindly increase their production. They said no. Uh, I still think they're there. I think that what this is showing is um, is a Saudi which is having to tread very delicately between two of what it, what it would see as its major consumers. Um, not so much the United States, but certainly China. And I feel that any any kind of way in which they can be seen to step onto the world stage and draw kind of cooperation between those two countries would do Saudi um, a lot of good in, in, in the global scheme of things. Well, uh, the Saudi one is a very interesting situation, especially considering the fact that they don't seem to have been a good ally to the United States in recent time. Uh, they've not been a good ally. But let's move on to the uh, story that stands out for me, the Oxfam cry that uh, a small percentage of the very rich, the super rich, are the ones that benefited the most from, um, from the COVID experience and the kind of money that was available. Do you think that the world leaders at Davos today will be listening and will do anything whatsoever in terms of creating a shift in movement of funds and finance that will help spread the money that is available, uh, uh, the wealth that is available, uh, available around the world uh, to people who have not made that much money from COVID? Uh, depends how much of a cynic you are. Um, if you're like me, the answer to that question is no. Uh, will they talk about it? Sure. Will, will, will a lot of wise heads um, bow in recognition of these rather startling facts that Oxfam have released? Yes, they will. Will they do anything about it? I suspect not. I mean, uh, Oxfam are calling, as you would expect, for a, a special tax on the ultra-rich. That starts to get extremely complicated. What, what is ultra-rich? How much should that tax be? And who's to say the accountants who... Um, who throng around these people will be saying, actually, do you know what? We'll shift that money to somewhere else. I mean, this, this, is, this is a big problem. Uh, how, however much we shake our heads and, and we say this is a great shame, the fact of the matter is it's really difficult to, 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 to actually do anything about something like this. It's all right recognizing these kind of things, but for Davos to be able to say to the ultra-rich who are thronging there, um, you'll be, you, we, you should be paying higher taxes, they may well not in agreement. But actually putting it into practice will be the devil's own job. Well, uh, coming in from the Bank of England, Governor, just one final question before we let you go, Michael. With regards to international investors still not trusting um, to lend money to the UK government despite um, the cost of government, what, 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 is the, what would that be the way out for the UK or what are they going to do in terms of shoring up that trust to attract investment? I, I have to say I'm a little surprised by this story because I thought they already had. I mean, if you believe in the bond markets, the bond markets have now settled down. And that's really what was at the base of what was going on. Um, Liz Truss is right, was right. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, an economy needs to have growth. It's just that she was saying these things um, at the wrong time. What what and Andrew Bailey is very, very keen to say he's not criticising the Sunak administration for, for anything. He's just saying that, you know, that the, the UK needs to establish a position of trust with overseas investors. Well, I think a child of three could have got to that sort of conclusion. And I think you and I would, would look at that and think, yeah, OK, fine. How, how, how are we going to do that? I think it's probably been done. I think what, what showed, um, as far as Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng were concerned, was what, what they weren't doing was bowing to, I suppose, what you might talk about, the financial orthodoxy, which is to be, was to, which is to run scared of the bond markets and it's just to 
really watch out for them and then when they settle assume that they're doing their job properly i i i don't see foreign investors actually if they got any sense uh, looking at what's going on right now in the uk i.e a real tight um a tight straight jacket on 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 spending a tight straight jacket on public spending um increased taxes uh and 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 a, a defeat of inflation as far as possible i mean what what, what's not what's not to tick all the boxes about that well thank you very much michael wilson for giving us the global business update